find a place to sit and let's uh, actually stand and we'll uh, start with the first song here. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and Joy, see what love has done. 
lift up and praise your name. We just thank you that you did come. We thank you that you came as a babe and, uh, and you came to set us free. Just ask now that you bless our time together here. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can sing. That sing praises to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Bridge Bible Fellowship. Great to see your smiling faces this morning. You are smiling, right? Yes. It's a beautiful day out there. We're going to continue in song. see you all. You know, I sit up front here and don't get a chance to look back, but it's awesome. yeah, it's awesome. Good group today. My name is Keith Ewis, and I have the privilege of doing the announcements today and making a few comments. Um, just, I'm, I'm not going to read much of this. You guys can read it. But uh, next week is the annual Christmas program, and that's always fun because it's kids and youth and then it'll be a short message, but uh, be sure and be here for that. That'll be a good one. Aaron, Aaron Brooks has something right now. So I did want to elaborate on, it's been an announcement a few weeks, this is Behold the Lamb and what this is all about and what's going on this week. So it's this Thursday and Friday at seven o'clock here at the church. Uh, we were doing this, uh, a concert called Behold the Lamb, just to gauge on this, who has actually heard or has a copy of Behold the Lamb by Andrew Peterson? Okay. So guys, if you have never heard of it, um, so Andrew Peterson, he's a singer-songwriter from Nashville, um, grew up in the church, got a son of a pastor, and um, like a lot of us, uh, you know, 
uh, we have Christmas albums. A lot of our Christmas albums are about Christmas and the, just the baby and Jesus and, and that sort of thing. But you miss the context of where the story came from. What's the whole point that Jesus came down? And the, the, in the context, this starts from the beginning. And this plan of love and salvation and forgiveness that happens. And so Andrew Peterson made this Christmas album to actually wrap around and uh, just put context into this. And so um, we in the Brooks family have a strict rule of no Christmas songs before Thanksgiving. And so, so many years, I think he put out this album about 1999 or something like that. Um, right after Thanksgiving dinner, we popped that album in. We just love it. Um, and we've always threatened to do this Christmas album. Uh, my daughter Maddie this year is finally inspired. Let's, let's do it, Dad, this year. And so we gathered a bunch of the musicians here at the church and uh, a couple uh, you guys see some faces that people don't, you don't normally go to church here, and we decided we're going to do this thing. And so it's a, it's a concert, it's not a play, it's a concert about songs, and the songs have a theme to it. It starts at the beginning and talks about the Passover and, and uh, exile and everything leads up to the birth of Christ. So um, we'd love to have you guys come and enjoy it with us. We're going to do it on Thursday and Friday night. Um, kind of gives opportunity for people. Other churches can come too and enjoy this, and I hope you guys can come and enjoy it um, and join us. So, 7 o'clock Thursday and Friday. Sounds good, Aaron. You know, our church has been in the book of Matthew for almost a year and a half. Isn't that amazing? And now, just 14 days before Christmas, we're towards the end of the book and the crucifixion of Christ, just two weeks before Christmas. Last week, Martin ended with this verse, they led him away to be crucified. That was the last verse of the section last week, and today Kirk is gonna talk about the crucifixion. Last week, Martin asked the question, where is God in this blood-soaked scene? Where is God in this blood-soaked scene? Crucifixion is a horrible, bloody, violent death. And we'll see that in the story today. But next week, we're going to relive the Christmas message and probably saying joy to the world. We already sang it today. And away in a manger. Those two messages seem so different, so inconsistent, so contradictory. Violence and death this week, and next week, birth and joy. It just, it doesn't seem to add up. And that's all centered around one person. And how can that be? So last week, Martin provided a couple of answers. And one of the answers was, not all plans that involve blood, gore, and death are diabolical. I had to look up what the word diabolical means. <laughs> but it means so evil that it must have come from the devil. But that was his statement. One of, his, one of his answers was, not all plans that involve blood, gore, and death are diabolical. And he gave the example of his grandmother who had open heart surgery, and they opened her chest up. That's bloody. That's violent. They repaired her heart, and she had 15 more years of life. So not all plans that involve blood, gore, and death are diabolical. Another answer he gave was, God's plan is fulfilled and will prevail. God's plan will, is fulfilled and will prevail. Jesus, coming to earth as a baby, living on earth as a, as a human for 30 years, teaching and demonstrating both his manhood and his godhood, was part of God's big plan. So we'll celebrate that in the next couple of weeks. But Jesus dying a horrible, violent death was also part of God's big plan. Last week at communion, we remembered and we celebrated as we partook of the symbols of his death, the bread and the juice, and we expressed our gratitude for his sacrifice. Both of these events, crucifixion and death and, and, and uh, birth, should give us joy. It should encourage us. So, you know, I, I think God brought this series in Matthew to this point in time as part of his big plan, as part of his overall plan. And part of that plan is to firm up our faith and give us encouragement. 
and lead us to gratitude. So that's what we'll hear about today as we hear about the crucifixion. And then in the next two weeks, we get to celebrate Christmas and Christ's birth. We'll see how those fit together. So join me in prayer, please. Father, thank you for, for today. Thank you for your word and for those who teach it here faithfully. Thank you for those that serve here, those who serve in children and music and, and shoveling snow and encouraging others and giving in all these different ways that people can serve. We praise you for that. I just pray today that you will open our hearts to your truth to, to this season. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, children are dismissed. And while the children are going down the stand, we'll continue in song. This, this song is about just what Keith talked about. Uh, we haven't done it for quite a while, so it may be unfamiliar with a lot of you, but we'll, we'll work our way through it. Salvation belongs to our God. Who sits on the throne forever and ever And to the Lamb who was slain Be glory and power forever and ever Amen Isaac and Abraham An altar without in faith, God himself would provide, slaves in a foreign land, a shepherd, a staff in hand, freedom from chains, a lamb's blood, a stain, God himself will provide, salvation belongs to our God. Sits on the throne forever and ever, and to the Lamb who was slain be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. A hill in Jerusalem, thieves and the sun. to our God who sits on the throne forever and ever and to the Lamb who was slain be glory and power forever and ever Redeemed of every nation come lift a banner of praise to returning one Lamb of God Rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you do.
Jesus made. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power. see you all and Merry Christmas. I'd like to start the greeting out way early and just keep going, right? It's a great season. Praise God. Um, Keith very well said that the interesting sort of um, contrasts that uh, we see and we've been seeing throughout Matthew, contrasts of, uh, you know, the character of Judas and the character of Jesus, contrasts of light and dark, uh, lost and found, um, and in the contrast of where we're at in this season, which is just so appropriate. And I just love how the providence of God works it in such a way that, you know, we've got this celebration of the most precious, beautiful, wonderful thing the world has, babies, right, in a manger. And this scene uh, contrasted with this tension of the most brutal, horrific way anybody could ever die, crucifixion. And we, as Christians, sit in the middle of that and we say, yeah, yeah. You don't get one without the other. Not how it works. I was, uh, some of you know I 
I start my day off most mornings uh, at Logos School. I teach, and I was first period of the day, and I was walking in the other day, and a real simple, sort of one of those simple moments that God gave me. I'm, I'm walking by the dumpster, and uh, apparently, I'm going to blame some young elementary student or maybe a high school boy. Didn't get his trash in the dumpster, and it was spread out right there, right by it, right. And here's the superintendent of the school picking it up, and I thought. There's a great contrast, you know. The superintendent, who should be worried with other things, is picking up trash. And I made the comment to him. I just said, you're on trash duty this morning, huh? And his response was quick, and it was genuine and true. He said, whatever the Lord gives me to do today. And I thought, that is a great picture of what we're going to talk about in Matthew 27. What the Lord had given the Son to do. And he was faithful and obedient to that very thing. What a contrast. The King of kings, Lord of lords butchered on a cross undeservedly for the very ones who were his enemy. So let's pray as we think and ponder that today. Father, we thank you for the gift of this morning. We thank you for the Christmas season, this Advent time. We thank you for song. We thank you for your word. We thank you for friends. And we thank you for the privilege we have in joining together to reflect, admire, contemplate, and hopefully, Lord, at my prayers, worship you, the one true King. Would you use the words of my mouth and the words of these pages, the messages uh, today, the interactions, all of it, would you use it for your glory, ultimately, to have your way in each of us. And I pray that you would draw many closer to you because of it. In Christ's name, amen. Matthew 27, we are in. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm going to jump in at verse 32. The first few verses here serves as sort of the setting for today's passage. It sets the tone and gives us the picture of what's going on. It starts as this, As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they, have, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided the garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and they kept watching him there. Matthew uh, seems to put a lot of emphasis, not necessarily on the, the death um, per se, but more of the scene and the, the mockery that's going on. If you were here last week, you might remember, and if not, you can go back and look at it. Verses 27 through 31, Martin ended on, is all Jesus being mocked, ridiculed. And here, even as it begins, we see a, a, a few elements, components that, that deal with that, and it's going to build on that mockery as well. But first and foremost, there's a lot that's been said of Simon the Cyrene. You know, we come up with another um, sermon on that, but I just wanted to mention it was, it was normal for criminals to have to carry the, the horizontal beam of their cross up to where they were going to be crucified. And here, very clearly as we've seen, Jesus was not able to. He was, he was in bad shape. And so the ESV says they compelled Simon. They forced him. That's what it means. They forced him. They grabbed him and conscripted him to say, hey, you're going to carry this. And he packed it up because Jesus couldn't. And they went to a place called Golgotha, which you're probably familiar with. As the text makes note for us, it's the place of the skull. And this wasn't necessarily at all because of it was a place of execution. It was probably because it looked like, the hill itself looked like a skull. And uh, while he's there, they offer him up uh, wine and gall, it says, to drink, and a, a numbing agent to basically uh, settle him down a little bit because of the pain, and he, he refuses it. He wouldn't take it. There's the scene. Building and building and building, right? In verse 37, it goes on, it says, And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. And two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. So there it is. A few things, very specific sort of mockeries here. It says, um, first and foremost, they, they put a sign up over him, right? And you see what it says, right? This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Listen to the ironies in these things. 
because here's this charge, and I think it was, they were putting this up to serve two purposes. One was probably to dissuade anybody that would want to claim kingship, and like, don't do this, There's, we're going to make an example of you. But also to serve, as, again, as a form of mockery. Ha, 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 look at the king of the Jews, right? Oh, and oh, the honor, the, the irony, right? Because yes, he is, very much so. And it says that people passed by and they derided and they insulted him. And in my text, again, the SV says they wagged their heads, which is, if you can imagine, you know, just a, a, a kind of an older expression we don't use, but just a shake of the heads like, oh, brother, like disappointment. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And then it says uh, they were saying to him, hey, you, you're the one that said, you're the one that said, hey, you'd, you would, tear down this temple and raise it up in three days, you know, referring back to, to Jesus' message that we looked at earlier. Three days, this is all, this temple's coming down. And we know what he was talking about, the temple of God, Jesus, not the, not the picture, the representation. And, and again, the irony, in three days, it will be rebuilt. And then the chief priests and the elders, right, and the Scribes, they mock him, which I think is the most profound irony of all of this section that we're looking at, right? This is, this is significant. Let him come down, or excuse me, they say in verse 40, 42, he says, he saved others and he cannot save himself. And you know the beauty of that thing? What they said, he, they're absolutely right. Absolutely right. He cannot save himself because he is saving others. Isn't that the irony? The one who is not able to save himself because of the gift he is giving to the sinful world, he's not able because he was paying the penalty for us. And he's doing it on behalf of everyone else. And then lastly, it says, let him come down. Let him come down. Then we'll believe him. As it continues on, verse 41 says, so also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him. They said, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Let him come down and we'll believe him. Prove it. Show us. You rem Again, this is just reminiscent of so many things that we've been learning and hopefully you're you're reminded of them a little bit. But earlier in Matthew, Jesus is speaking, and he was in Matthew 11, and he was denouncing cities. I don't know if you remember this or not. Let me refresh your memory. He's denouncing cities that uh, were, were actually said in Matthew 11 where most of his mighty works were done. Most of his mighty works were done in these places, and people wouldn't believe him. And this is what he says in denouncing those cities. Because they... Woe to you, he says, because you did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in your towns had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. If you remember the context, he's saying, look, if, if the things that were done in the places here and now were done in two of the most horrific cities that you know about in your history, those cities would have repented. That's how bad you are. So here they are saying, if he'll come down, we'll believe. And the reality is, no, they won't. No, they won't. The great theologian John Frame said, the real problem with unbelievers is not intellectual. It's true today, too. People don't refuse Jesus because there's some sort of intellectual problem. They refuse Christ because their hearts are hard. And here, in the midst of all these uh, accusations and all these ironies, the hardness of heart continues to be very, very apparent. Now in verses 45 through 47, there's a series of miracles that, that follow. They're reviling Jesus, they're wagging their heads, and then listen to what happens here. Pay attention to these, these, these events. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. That's not normal. Okay? The sixth hour is noon, the ninth hour is three. And darkness comes over all the land, it says. 
I don't think this was an isolated darkness. I think that the text makes a strong statement. But this is this is darkness across everywhere. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, "Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani?" That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, "This man is calling Elijah." So here he is in his in his final moments. There's darkness all over the land, and Jesus yells this very um, uh, familiar statement. If you've been coming to church very much, you know, like, aha, yes, I've, we've heard this many a time, right? There's a couple things that I want to, to draw our attention to. One, the, the, the concept of darkness all throughout Scripture, we see, whenever it's used, is, is used as divine judgment. Darkness is not a good thing. And again, I'm going to remind you of something we've already learned um, back in Matthew chapter 24, where we were walking through the Olivet Discourse as just one example. This is what Jesus says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Darkness communicates judgment. We see that a lot in the Old Testament as well. And the Jews would have been, well, you think they would have been aware. Like something is not normal. And even today we want to say, was it an eclipse or what? Well, I, I don't know how it worked, but we see God in control of all creation. He brings darkness over the land, and he is, he is executing in this moment judgment. And I think darkness is the, is, is the picture, it's a representation of what's going on exactly here, driving that point home. And you hear Jesus yell out, scream actually is some translations, he screamed this phraseology, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Much could be said on this phrase alone, right? concept of being forsaken. It means to be abandoned or deserted. What's going on here? This is critical because as, as you've maybe heard me mention and others before, the crucifixion was horrific. The physical death was not like anything we could imagine. And, and even culturally, the Romans like, you, you know, they did not. They saw it. I mean, these guys were trained torturers and they thought crucifixion is the worst way you could die. But there's something even more significant, more painful, and more brutal going on here. The Trinitarian God, Jesus and the Father specifically, are being torn apart because Jesus is taking upon himself the sins of the world. And God cannot be in the presence of sin. He cannot look upon it. The Old Testament and the New Testament both speak to this. There's a separation here, an abandonment that is happening that we, we will probably never, ever fully understand, even on the other side of eternity. And Jesus takes upon the sins of the world, and he, and he separates himself from the Father. 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite verses of all of Scripture, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This event right here is something that I think we can easily skip over, but what is taking place right here is incredible. And we you go home and think about that. What did he endure? What did he really take upon himself? All the filth, all the muck, all the sin, and he is forsaken by the Father. He cries out, and they think, because of a mistranslation, maybe he's calling on Elijah this prophet, to come and save him. And they speculate on that. And as, the, as uh, verse 48 and 50 go on to say, and what, one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. This was not an act of mercy. This, they're, they're not giving him sour wine to be like, oh, he's thirsty. Sour wine was a was a commoner's drink, right? They're seeking to refresh him, not because they feel bad, but because they're making a spectacle of him. Did you hear what they say afterward? Let's see if let's see if Elijah comes. Let's prolong his death and let's see what happens. Give him something to drink. And then we see this series of weird stuff. Again, those miracles happening here as it continues in verse 51. Or excuse me, uh, verse 49. 
50, excuse me, there it is, 50. Can't see, I know, I've got to get my glasses here. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened. Many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Don't miss these things. These are all things that uh, are, are very critical in the greater biblical narrative, some of which you may even see if you come to behold the Lamb. But first and foremost, I think it's important to pay attention. As this happens, as he yields as his spirit, it says that the curtain of the temple was torn into from the top to the bottom. This is not a simple drapery that you'd see over, you know, one of our picture windows at our house or something. This was a serious piece of fabric. And in this very moment, with lots and lots of people in the temple and around Jerusalem, right, because this stuff's going down, all of a sudden this veil, a very specific veil, massive, in the temple that separates the holy place from the, the, the holiest of holies, it's torn, it's ripped. Now, this is critical because in understanding the biblical narrative, that was the one place that no one was ever to enter except for the high priest once a year. That was the manifestation within that spot was the, was the manifestation of God. That's where he resided. And so throughout the Jewish uh, sacrificial system, you had to perform the sacrifice and you had to have you had to have access into the presence of God. And that was the whole point. He is inaccessible. You can't get there. One time a year, the priest would do it, and he would perform the sacrifice for himself, for the ark itself, and for the community. And then he could pass in, and, then, and it, was a danger, it was a dangerous effort, right? Well, all of a sudden, when Jesus dies, that veil is torn. Well, what in the world does that have to do with anything? And if you know your Bible, you know that at that moment, because of what was happening on the cross, the sacrifice of all sacrifices, the atoning sacrifice to end the sacrifice was taking place, therefore making access for all to enter into the presence of God by way of Jesus. He is now our conduit. He is now the path that we can take. Hebrews speaks of this in chapter 10, verse 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Jesus is the fulfillment of that sacrificial system. The veil is torn. And now we have access to God in that holy place. Second of all, though, did you catch it? It says that the earth was shaken. Tombs opened up. There was, there was a serious disruption of nature going on here, an earthquake. And all throughout Scripture we see, again, whenever God's presence is manifest in certain ways, earthquakes tends to be the sort of symbol where he's like, hey, the dinner bell, wake up, I'm doing something here. Acts 4. When the early church was moving on in Acts chapter 4, they prayed. And after they prayed, it says that the Holy Spirit showed up and just would follow them. An earthquake. We see it in Zephaniah. We see it all over in the Old Testament too. The point is, earth is shaken. There's a disruption of nature. This curtain is torn. And then, there's a resurrection. I want to make sure you see something here in the text though. It says, the earth shook, the rocks were split, period. 52. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city. I don't think this is happening simultaneously. I think, as Matthew says, hey, after his resurrection, there was a resurrection. Many resurrections. Many. You know, like Lazarus, we see these, Jairus' daughter. We see things like that happening, and here all of a sudden, because what 1 Corinthians 15.3 says is that, 15.23, excuse me, Jesus is the first fruits of the dead. He sets a tone. He's the front runner of the resurrection, of which we can all await too. There's more, so much can be said, but the point I want you to get is all of a sudden we see these miraculous events taking place because of this pivotal moment in time Jesus' crucifixion. 
As the section concludes in verse 50, 54, it says, When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. That's a whole other sermon in and of itself, right? The centurion was over a hundred men. He was, a, he was trained in torture. He had seen a lot of crucifixions. He's watching everything shake out. And we don't know a whole lot, but we know what he says. This is the Son of God. There's a response there, isn't there? He had the evidences. I think we could talk a lot about, as an apologetic, hey, there's stuff to be said about the centurion. But we're not going to today, because that's not the point that I think that uh, the fuller point of this text, or the point I want to make. And then lastly, it concludes in verse 55 and 56, this sort of, almost like a, a strange little commentary or addendum. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. This, this strange sort of thing that is just thrown in there that seems strange to us. But here's, here's kind of the, again, the, the, a real important function of this account. You've heard it come up as we've been talking through here that Jesus' use of women as uh, eyewitness accounts or even in, in a lot of what he did, that was not normal in the culture of the time. There are many who would say this is just another one of many, many reasons why the biblical account is not a fabricated account. Because if you were doing your best effort to make up a big fat lie that you wanted the world to believe, you would never ever at this time in recording history said, hey, there were some women that were there. The women gave an account. Or the first people to the tomb were women. Because their, their, their testimony was not upheld. It, wasn't, it didn't have weight. So those who use scriptural scrutiny, and they're like, it's got to be true because of the fact that that stuff exists, because that account is in here. You see the point? Like, you would never include that if you were trying to fabricate a lie. That would not give you a good case. But because it actually happened that way, it's recorded. And it's another fascinating component to this whole greater story. Now here's, here's kind of the gist of this. There's so many things to discuss and look at in this contrast of interesting things going on. Here, here's, the, here's where I want to land the plane this morning. Here's where I want to conclude as we, as we contemplate this section of, of Scripture. Okay? Like I said, you could write a book about the, cent, the centurion, and, it, and it's worth talking. Hey, it's worth thinking about that. Look at his response. He took these things that he saw, that he experienced, and he said, he, he confessed, he, he recognized at some level, we don't see the outcome of that. We do see in other gospel accounts, one of the criminals, with his subtle little bit of like what he understood about Jesus, remember that? Oh, this guy hasn't done anything to deserve it. But we have. And Jesus' response is, you'll be in paradise. You get it. There's a lot that could be said there. I, I don't want to go that route. I don't want to take the, the apologetic account. I wanted to look at a very specific thing that I think is, is easily missed. And in verse, I want to take you back to verses 48 through 50. Verses 48 through 50 says this. When Jesus was given the sour wine of which he refused, in that moment, When he was given the sour wine, he's thirsty, excuse me, not, not the gall, but the sour wine, when he gave him the sponge, and he put it on a reed, and he gave him a drink, and they wanted to see what would happen, is when Jesus cried out, that's what Matthew says, he cried out with a loud voice, and then it says he yielded his spirit. That's all we get here. In John's account, we get what he cried out with. John tells us. In his last words, in the same chronology when he is offered up the sour wine, he cries out, and John's the one account that tells us what he says. It's finished. It's finished. And then it says, he yielded up his spirit. This is critical. Don't miss this. Okay? He finished. He's all done. It is over. And he, he yielded his spirit. He gave up his spirit. You hear that? Like, that's so important. Nobody took it from him. 
Nobody, nobody took Jesus' life from him. He gave it. And that's such a little nuance, but as us as Christians, we've got to understand that, especially when we come in to the Christmas season. Because Emmanuel, God is with us, came by way of this purposed plan to save us from the dominion of darkness. He did it. You didn't do any of it. He's in control. They didn't kill him in the sense of like, hey, look at we're winning. He gave his life as an offering. And he had planned this, he had purposed this, all for the sake of taking care of our sin condition. Now, so here, here's the other point to that. He did it. It is finished. And in verse 46, it was the sixth hour, remember, and he yells out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? The separation of the Father, right? I think there's something very specifically going on here. Some of you maybe are aware of where, where I'm going. I, I don't think that Jesus is crying out like, oh, no, what are you doing? You failed me, God. Kind of you forsaken me. Like I mentioned, he says, hey, we're separated. We're broken. We're, we're no longer in this unity. I think he's quoting Psalm 22. Psalm 22, because Jesus knew his scripture, and in his last moments, in his final hours, he goes to the Word of God. And it begins, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A psalm of David in a time of great uh, mourning and anguish. He writes Psalm 22, a prophetic psalm. And you know what's interesting? Some of you that are, have been coming to BBF for a while, you might recognize Psalm 22. We do it every year. On a very specific day, we read this song to conclude a very, very important service on Good Friday. We read this every year. Psalm 22 begins with this. Verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 6 and 7 says, I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me and wag their heads. Sound familiar? Moving on to verse 16, it says, For dogs encompass me. A company, a, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And my clothing they cast for lots. But you, O Lord... Do not be far off. Hello, Siri. I am. I'll do it again for you if you want. <laughs> Bless her heart. My secretary. <laughs> but you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly. Come quickly to my aid. If you're here on Good Friday, we read that, and that's when we blow out the last candle and we all go home. And we contemplate what Jesus did. But you know how this ends? Moving down into verse 27. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And as it concludes in verse 31, they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Some translations that it is finished. It is finished. What's finished? The work that he came to do. The baby wrapped in those swaddling cloths, laid in a manger. Emmanuel, God is with us. The beautiful picture of our coming Messiah, bookended with a brutal, horrific death. All so that he could say, It is finished. No more striving. No more performance, no more need to impress, it is done. You're no longer defined by sin. You're no longer defined by that old man. You are made new. It is all finished. That's why he came, purposed to do all the way to completion the thing that God had given him to do. Whatever the Lord would give him to do. Just like picking up that day outside the dumpster, whatever the Lord would give him to do. 
surrendering his life and yielding on a cross. Matthew 20. Matthew 20 reminds us, verse 28, this morning, the very, very thing that he said he came to do. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom of me. That's what he came to do. That's why we celebrate Christmas and we gather. We give those gifts because he's the gift giver. And we do it because we know how it, how it ends. And it is finished. And today, today that's what we do is we remember that it is finished. There's your application. Those You need that as you go out. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? You remember today that it is finished. The debt of sin has been paid. It is over. You're made good. You're made clean. And it's only because of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, thank you so very much that you did the very thing that none of us could ever do and that you sent your Son, your one and only Son, whom you love, to take upon himself the sin and the debt of the world, those who hated him, wagged their heads at him, despised him and reviled him, us included. He bore our guilt so that we could go free. We thank you so very much this Christmas season yet again that be only because of you it is finished. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Kirk. Let's stand and we'll sing our last song.
thankful that you did, you did come, that you walked this earth, that you most importantly bled and died, and rose again to give us new life. We just thank you. Thank you for this day that you've given to us. Help us to remember that as we go out and we meet those during the season that don't know you, that have never even thought about that. And um, as you bring them across our paths, that you, you uh, give us words to say to them. Let's give them words of life, words of hope. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day.